The International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR, is a set of United States government regulations that control the export and import of defence-related articles and services on the United States munitions list. Often, space-related technologies fall under this. We wonder, would this be true of technology for a lunar greenhouse? As far as uh, restrictions on exchange of technologies, uh, we deal with crops and plants and uh, the agricultural, horticultural uh, environment between all the countries is, is pretty much open. We, uh, we have a lot of people we, we deal with that are Russian, that are European, Jap Japanese. Uh, there's no problem there. But as far as what our cultural diets dictate in space, that might be more of a problem. At South Pole, there was quite a bit of uh, feedback from the crew that too much lettuce, or great on the cucumbers, uh, what about the tomatoes? For space applications, I think we're probably going to have to work the problem from the plant to the people rather than the people to the plant in that we need plants to do multiple purposes, wear many hats. They, they've got to keep us breathing and giving us oxygen, and then they also have to supplement the amount of calorie intake, our, our food. And I think what I'm looking for is what are the best plants to do that job? And secondary, I ask, okay, well, how popular will these plants be among the crew after they've done their job of keeping the crew breathing air? Then, you know, is this tasty? And is it something that would satisfy an international crew of astronauts? And, you know, my feeling is that going to the moon as an astronaut, global as that, that, that idea is, I think those people are going to be, at some level, willing to eat what's ever put in front of them because it means they get to go on a journey that's extraordinary. As an example, if, if an astronaut had to eat mealyworms because it's just far more efficient to grow mealyworms than it is cattle on, on, on the moon, I think it would be hard to swallow, uh, but they'd get it down, and whether it's mealyworms or, or cow, it'll keep you just as alive. And being alive on the moon, whether you're a tomato plant, a mealyworm, or a human being, that's going to be a hazardous, harsh place to make a living, so bon appetit. Food is extremely important as far as your morale and stuff. You, you spend most of your day, you know, you get up in the morning, you wonder what's for breakfast, and then you spend most of the time before lunch wondering what's for lunch, and then before dinner, what's for dinner, you know? It's, but another thing is that it helps you keep track of time. Like if you once a week have steak night or some sort of special food night, it allows you to recognize what day it is. The South Pole Food Growth Chamber itself wasn't made for space applications. The model that was developed was something that was secondary. The primary reason for the South Pole Food Growth Chamber was to improve morale. And it improves morale in giving the crew that are stuck down there over the austral winter eight months of isolation. They now have fresh vegetables at their meals. When I was there, we had a fresh salad for both lunch and dinner every day. And that's just one of the ways, you know, crunchy vegetables that you can have when you're isolated in the dark. The next thing it did for the crew was they had a, a nice bright place that they could go into and sit in high humidity outside the humidity on station is uh, in the teens. So it's very, very dry. They go into the greenhouse, they get high humidity, they get bright lights, and for lunch and dinner they get something fresh and crunchy. So food is very important and certainly that's the primary reason that that I got the opportunity to go down to the South Pole and, and learn what I did.